the beauty of spring. Like all the seasons, spring brings delight to our senses. We can hear it. Smell it. Taste it. Touch it. And we can see it. Of course, what we see and how we see is up to us. And that's what we're going to talk about today. A way of seeing that will allow us to take better pictures. In this exploring photography program, we'll be learning to see in new and different ways. Seeing with a photographic eye or an eye for photographic composition. Let's talk about seeing for a minute. When we're born and during the early years of life, we quickly learn to see in order to survive. We come to recognize the safety of a mother's face or the danger of an onrushing car. The habit of seeing for surviving stays with us on into adult years. It becomes instinctive, something we take for granted. Unfortunately, there are many other things in the world of sight that we take for granted as well. We go busily through our lives looking down, as it were, and we often don't take time to appreciate the abundant riches available to our eyes or to the lens of our camera. For the next 20 minutes or so, we're going to learn about certain guidelines that will help us arrange what we see in new and interesting ways. Once you've watched this tape several times and absorbed the information in it, two things will happen. First, you'll begin to appreciate the nearly infinite variety of the visual world that surrounds us. And second, you'll take better pictures. For one thing, think of the tape as a tool. Like any good tool, the more you use it, the more help it will be to you. I'd suggest playing it through a few times to familiarize yourself with the basic images and ideas. But then, if there's something that especially interests you, like the rules of thirds or the concept of balance, why not concentrate on that section by stopping the tape, replaying it, and even comparing some of your own photographs to the ones we've used as illustrations? And then, by all means, go out and take pictures. Then watch the tape again. Before long, you'll notice a difference in the quality of your photography. And more importantly, you'll notice a difference in the way you see. And seeing, as I said at the beginning, is what photographic composition is all about. And above all, have fun. The joy of this program and all the programs in the Exploring Photography series is the way in which you'll find new opportunities for better pictures and new challenges for your imagination. With that in mind, I welcome you to this adventure in Exploring Photography, the art of composition. Have you ever wondered why some pictures, including your own, are more appealing than others? Why some hang in galleries for months or even years to be enjoyed by thousands? Have you ever wondered why some photographers consistently win the praises of critics and judges? And most important, have you ever wondered why many of your own photographs strike you as just average? while only a few seem truly exceptional? One of the main reasons why some pictures are more outstanding than others is because of their strong composition. And composition, the art of seeing and arranging subjects in a pleasing and interesting way, is what this program is all about. Of course, good composition is not limited to photography. Architects were familiar with the principles of composition 2,000 years before photography was invented, and artists throughout history have used composition to give focus and balance to their drawings and paintings. But whether it's architecture, art, or photography, the idea is the same. The pleasing selection and arrangement of subjects within the picture area. The words selection and arrangement implies something very important about good composition. Namely, well-composed pictures don't happen by accident. They're created, often with a good deal of careful planning and patient waiting.
and always with a knowledge of six basic guidelines that form the basis of all well-conceived photography. What are these guidelines? Simplicity, the rule of thirds, lines, balance, framing, and mergers. We're going to take a look at these guidelines one by one. The important thing to remember is that they're guidelines, not rules. So photographic composition is an expression of your natural sense of design. The guidelines help you develop that sense. They don't dictate it to you. Now let's take a look at the first and perhaps most important guideline, simplicity. To keep a picture simple, look for ways to give the center of interest the most visual attention. One way is to select uncomplicated backgrounds that will not steal or divert attention from your main subject. Let's see how we can improve this photo by looking for visual simplicity. Let's first decide if we want our center of interest to be the public telephone, the bridge, or the cactus. Bear in mind, any of these subjects could make an interesting picture. All the simplicity guideline is telling us is to concentrate on one subject at a time. Here we chose the cactus as the main subject. And by moving in closer and using the plain sky as the background, we've simplified and improved this photograph. Here's another example. We are certainly close enough to our subject in both pictures, but the busy background on the left camouflages the seagull. Just change your point of view slightly, and presto, your seagull stands prominently against the blue sky. One way of thinking about simplicity is to ask yourself if your reason for taking the picture is clearly seen. In the example on the left, it's probably safe to assume that the center of interest was supposed to be the old mission house. But the parking lot occupies nearly half the picture and contradicts the feeling of antiquity related to the mission. On the right, we've moved in a bit closer. Now the purpose is clear. We wanted a picture of the mission house, and here it is. The visual information in the picture on the right is simple and direct. Sometimes, often in fact, two or three different treatments of the same subject will fall within the guidelines of composition simplicity, and then the choice will be up to you. One frequent choice you will have to make is how much of your subject to include. Should it be framed horizontally, as we've done here, or vertically, as we've indicated with these frame lines? The choice is yours. Both pictures are simple and pleasing to the eye. So. You can simplify your pictures and strengthen your center of interest in the following ways. Choose uncomplicated backgrounds. Avoid competing or unrelated subjects. Move in close. And if you want to make your center of interest even more dynamic, place it slightly off-center in your frame, the way we've done with this young artist. The concept of off-center placement brings us to the second of our six guidelines for strong photographic composition. It's called the rule of thirds, and it'll help make a good picture even better. Here's how it works. Before you snap your picture, which in this case is a picture of me, imagine that your picture area is divided into thirds, both horizontally and vertically, the way it is on your screen. See the circles? They represent the intersections of the lines dividing your picture area. And these lines give you choices. Watch. Right now, I'm sitting in the middle of the picture, and it's not particularly interesting. But if the camera moves like this, so that my head is near the lower left circle, you've suddenly got more space to work with. And even if it's just empty space, it somehow makes the picture much more interesting. Likewise, if the camera moves like this, so that I'm near the circle on the upper right, the picture again is more interesting. I could be ready to work at this large desk. And the empty space to my right dramatizes all the work I've got to do. Let's see some other examples. Here's another seagull. We've placed him directly in the center of the picture, and while the guidelines for simplicity are nicely observed, the picture somehow seems static and uninteresting. 
But watch what happens when we shift our point of view ever so slightly and move the seagull to the upper right. Now we can see his full shadow and more of his tracks. It's a more interesting picture. In this picture, the lighthouse seems well placed in the upper right, if only because the rest of the scene fits nicely into the format. The open space on the left also dramatizes the subject. The light from the lighthouse has somewhere to go. Giving objects and people a sense of direction is an important function of the rule of thirds. Here, the model has a definite path to follow. The photographer's job is also made easier in this case because he can place the model anywhere he chooses along the walkway. A good rule of thumb is to always consider the path of moving subjects and generally leave space in front of them in which they can move. If you don't, here's what can happen. This jogger looks like she's going to run right out of the picture. By placing the subject in the lower left position, we've used the rule of thirds and given the jogger plenty of room to run within the picture area. Here's another action shot where it's important to leave more space in front of a moving subject than behind it. The rule of thirds can also be very helpful in deciding where to place horizons in your photographs. Here, the sailboat and the horizon are right in the middle of the picture and the result is a static feeling. What would you try in this case? How about moving the horizon to the upper third and the sailboat to the left? That's better, isn't it? But remember, these are only guidelines, and if you don't like this subject placement, try something else. Like this. Now the horizon line is in the lower third. Here's another rule of thumb. Place the horizon high or low in your scenes, but rarely in the middle. The same thing applies to verticals. It's generally best to place them off-center. In the picture on the left, the subject is centered. But in the one on the right, the photographer got a more interesting picture simply by changing his point of view. In this case, he simply moved about 10 feet to the left. We've talked about simplicity and we've talked about the rule of thirds. Hopefully, we're beginning to see that the guidelines for good photographic composition are closely related to one another. That should become even more apparent when we talk about our next subject. Lines. Watch. As you can see, lines and shapes definitely do play a part in good photographic composition. But once again, displaying them effectively involves using other composition guidelines as well, including our old friend simplicity. This structure has beautiful lines, and they're beautifully shown in this photograph. But look what happens when we forget about using uncomplicated backgrounds. The lines of the pole on the left virtually vanish, and our purpose in taking the photograph becomes unclear. Remember, keep it simple. Let the lines work for you. Here's a stunning example of how diagonal lines can work in a picture. Can you imagine this photograph without them? You can also use diagonals as leading lines to lead the way into a picture. It's a simple and easy path for the eye to follow to the main subject. You can also use repetitive lines in the same way. They draw your viewer's attention to your center of interest. One of the most common and graceful lines used in composition is called the S-curve.
Here's another S-curve that forms a diagonal leading line. This picture also observes the rule of thirds. The center of interest is almost perfectly placed in the lower left. The result? A photograph that's interesting and easy to look at. The photograph on the left is okay. It's a close-up, and the background is fairly simple. But wouldn't the composition be better if the flamingo's neck weren't so straight? Here's what we're looking for. The flamingo has relaxed, and his neck now forms a pleasing S-curve against a better background. Other geometric shapes besides S-curves can also help your picture composition. Can you see the triangle you get by connecting imaginary lines between the three nuns? The triangle adds strong visual unity to the picture. This picture is an excellent example of the use of lines for strong composition. Take a moment to study how many different triangles are formed by the couple and their reflections. Note, too, how the repetitive horizontal lines of the breaking waves offset the triangular lines created by the couple. Balance. Balance is important not only in photography, but in just about everything we do. We live and breathe because of a precise balance of chemicals in our bodies. The planet Earth exists because of a balance in our solar system. Our government works because of a series of checks and balances in our democracy. And good photography exists when the camera's viewpoint and the subject placement are carefully selected to balance all the elements in the picture. Notice how the leaves, window, and couple all seem to be in the right place in this photograph. They're well balanced. Good balance is basically simple. It's the arrangement of shapes, colors, or areas of light and dark in a complementary way. The result is a picture that looks like this, and not like this. This is a lopsided picture. Karen looks like she's going to fall right out of the photo due to lack of visible support. Let's move the camera's viewpoint and give the wagon she's sitting on another wheel. There. Karen is still off-center, in keeping with the rule of thirds, but she has support. We needed that other circle to complete the picture. There are different kinds of balance. Imagine these two couples are standing at either end of a pair of scales. They are evenly or symmetrically balanced. Here's an example of non-symmetrical balance. The large single head balances the small child on the right. In general, this kind of balance is more interesting to look at than symmetrical balance. This, for example, is a balanced photograph. But because of their symmetry, the subjects can be separated into two vertical pictures, and that tends to divide the viewer's attention. Look for balance that unifies rather than divides your picture. There are usually several ways to arrange or balance your subjects. You may prefer the more formal feeling of the picture on the left or the more relaxed, informal pose of this one. Both pictures are well balanced. Can you guess what our next guideline is? That's right. We're going to talk about framing. Now, of course, we don't mean this kind of framing, although the, the principle is the same. Let's look at a few examples. Here, we've again used trees to frame the center of interest, the sailboat. The strong, dark framing objects in the foreground give this picture the depth it needs to make it more than just another snapshot. Whether or not you use a frame for a picture will depend on each new subject. What you choose as a frame for a scene will, of course, vary as well. The picture of the Washington Monument on the left is composed in the center without a frame. The picture on the right has a stronger feeling of depth and tells a more complete story because the photographer chose an appropriate foreground to complement his subject. Note how the principles of balance and lines work in this picture as well. This would probably be a fairly boring scene if it weren't for the horses, riders, and overhanging trees in the foreground. Once again, the framing objects in the foreground give the picture depth and make it easier to understand. We've said throughout the program that there's often more than one way to apply the principles of photographic composition. Framing is no exception. 
These two pictures of the Iwo Jima monument effectively use framing for added dimension and interest. Which one do you prefer? The choice is yours. If it looks to you like the coat rack behind me is coming out of the side of my head, and if that strikes you as a bit silly, then you already understand the importance of our final guidelines for good composition, avoiding mergers. And if you think I look silly with a coat rack coming out of my head, just look at poor Dave here, who has a tree growing out of his. The merger of the tree with Dave's head is so obvious, you'd think no one could avoid seeing it before snapping the shutter. Ah, but remember, we see things in three dimensions, and it's easier than we think to focus our eyes on the principal subject and not see the background at all. Remember, too, what we said at the beginning about simplicity and the importance of choosing backgrounds that do not compete with our center of interest? Choosing simple backgrounds is one good way of avoiding mergers. In Dave's case, correcting the problem was quite simple, and it's a technique we've encountered before. Change the point of view by moving a few feet to the right or left. This is a fun picture, but it looks crowded because we've cut off people's heads and feet. That's called a border merger. To avoid border mergers, line your eye up squarely behind the viewfinder and be sure to leave a little space around everyone. Near mergers are objects or lines that are just too close to the principal subject. In this case, the umbrella and the ball. Near mergers aren't quite as objectionable as complete mergers, but they steal attention from your center of interest. Let's correct these near mergers by using a low angle, and we'll use only one prop for simplicity. Let's also make sure the frisbee is held far enough away from Karen's face to avoid another near merger. Well, there they are. Six guidelines for better photographic composition. Let's briefly review them. Simplicity. Remember the importance of close-ups and uncomplicated backgrounds. The rule of thirds. Avoid placing your center of interest in the middle of your picture. Lines. Look for strong lines and pleasing geometric shapes, like S-curves. Choose backgrounds that allow the lines to work. Balance. Use all the elements in a picture, lines, color, light, and dark areas, to create a pleasing symmetry. Framing. Use objects in the foreground to give depth to your center of interest. Mergers. Avoid mergers. A good way of doing that is to choose simple, uncomplicated backgrounds. The most important thing to remember is that these guidelines, which are interrelated and based on the principle of simplicity, are merely a foundation for the truly creative work of seeing a picture and knowing when to snap the shutter. The chances are you'll only use a few of these guidelines at a time, and sometimes you won't use them at all. This prize-winning photograph, for instance, ignores a few guidelines and places the subject in the center of the format, but the strength of the face and the drama of the simple black background make this picture work. One other thing, Often, you don't have time to compose your pictures as carefully as you might like. That elusive quality called human interest often depends on your ability to react quickly, and you're forced to overlook a few guidelines. When that happens, you can make some corrections after you take the picture. It's called cropping, and it allows you to trim or enlarge portions of the picture like this. This picture is cropped to a square format. But is that the way you'd really like it? To see if you'd like to change its proportions, hold your hands out in front of you, like this, and try cropping the picture as a vertical. You've probably seen artists do this. Now try a horizontal cropping. This is a good way to look at pictures, improve them, and develop your photographic eye. Here's a simple cropping guideline. Include the portions of your subject that you feel are most interesting and most important. For instance, you may like this portrait of Pat in a square format or crop to a horizontal. On the other hand, many people prefer portraits of individuals that are cropped vertically. The subjects seem to fit better. The choice, of course, is yours. 
Here's a photograph that has simplicity and a strong center of interest. It's composed with plenty of extra space around it to allow for a variety of print croppings. How would you crop this picture? Horizontal or vertical? And where would you place the center of interest? In the end, it comes down to a matter of judgment, taste, and experience. And of course, a knowledge of our six basic guidelines for good composition. Before we close our program, let's try a little exercise. We'll take a look at three or four different photographs. Try to explain which ones you prefer. Think back over the six guidelines and look for ways in which these pictures use those guidelines effectively. You know, looking at those pictures just now, I kept thinking about the wonderful challenges photography presents to our imagination. There are so many different ways of seeing the world around us, and so many different ways of interpreting life's images. The guidelines of composition help us arrange all those fascinating images in a way that pleases the eye and stimulates the mind, and that's why they're so important. They make our pictures interesting. But above all, Composition is fun, because the more you learn how to compose a picture, the more you'll find that you're expressing yourself and your view of the world with facility and freedom. Oh, by the way, the more you use this tape, the more the basic principles of composition will become second nature. They're just six fundamental ideas. Simplicity, rule of thirds, lines, balance, framing, and mergers. But if you put them to use, they will indeed add a whole new dimension to the pictures you take and the memories you keep. Thanks for watching, and have a great time taking pictures. <laughs>